So Zerud Moral says that, that a real enslavement is to an opposite. So the Moral explains that Mitzrayim is opposite Israel in a very, very meaningful way. And uh, the Moral uses terms which are uh, used through and through. Chaimer and Sura. Now, uh, these are borrowed from uh, the Hebrew translations of uh, Aristotle, but the morale uses them in slightly different ways. Chaymer, which means material, means uh, the physical side of existence. Uh, when a person is attached to Chaymer, he is interested in the most fundamental bodily desires, food, drink, uh, the opposite gender, etc. In other words, the, the, those are the, the interests of the chaymer, the interests of the body. The tsura, tsura, which translates as the form, but according to the morale means really the spirit. Uh, there are other things, there are higher things. You know, the, the joys of the intellect, understanding, cleaving to God, etc. He says that Mitzrayim is related to the chaymer. It says in the Paschal of Mishraim Asher, Besar Chalmerim Sarum. Their flesh is the flesh of donkeys. Now, the word Chamor, you see in the word Chamor is the word Chaymer, the word material. Uh, a Chamor was considered very, very much material and not spiritual at all. Apparently, um, a, a donkey is considered less intelligent than a horse. Uh, it's considered fairly dumb. And, uh, Therefore, it, it represents uh, the material side of things. It eats, it drinks, it mates, but uh, it's incapable of higher thought or a spiritual experience. It's chamor. It's chaymer. And the Mitzrayim is called that. Asher basar chamerim basarim. Their flesh is the flesh of donkeys. That's what Mitzrayim was. Yisroel. Yisroel is disembodied spirit. Yisroel is uh, the intellect. It's the emotion, it's the uh, spiritual connection to God. That's what Yisrael is. When Yisrael finds itself in a place where its masters are only interested in the experiences of the body, the pleasures of the body, that is so antithetical to everything they stand for, it, it's abhorrent, it's disgusting. But imagine you are working for someone whose objectives and goals are so contrary to anything you value, anything you appreciate, that that's a real enslavement. That's a real enslavement. And uh, that's why it was Mitzrayim Dafka, because Mitzrayim is the opposite of what Yisrael is. And uh, it's a very interesting thing. The morale brings a, a uh, safra. In Parshas Achri Mos, in the introduction to the Parsha of Arias, in the introduction to the prohibited marriages, it says, Don't do the actions of the land in Mitzrayim in which you lived. So it says, the Safra says like this, that Mitzrayim was the most depraved of all the nations. In terms of its sexual practices, it was the most disgusting, the most depraved. The part of Mitzrayim in which the Jews lived was the worst place. That's Kemasi Eretz Mitzrayim Asher Yeshaftim meaning don't do like they did in the part of Eretz Mitzrayim in which you lived. And then the Safra says something astounding. It says, and why was it that way? Why was it that that part of Mitzrayim was the most depraved, the most disgusting? Because you lived there. Because the Jews lived there. This is behavior of the Mitzrayim yeah. in Goshen. In, in, in that way. So the question is, uh, how do you blame the Jews? Sometimes, you know, you get blamed for something and you wonder, like, uh, how are you going <laughs> to blame me for this? What did I do here? So the morale says an amazing thing. The morale says, when you have um, an interaction, of two opposites. So several things can happen. You could have synthesis, 
thesis, antithesis, synthesis, there's a blending, coming together, or you can have a polarization, where each side digs in its heels and becomes more strident and more firm in its position. So uh, Maral says that's what happened in Mitzrayim. In other words, the Jews stood for Kedusha, they stood for purity, and the Egyptians were so revolted by this holier-than-thou attitude that the Egyptians decided they had to become even more forceful in their uh, promiscuity and in their preachers, and uh, therefore the Jews dug in their heels deeper and went back and forth. Um, you know, we experience this nowadays. I'm not an expert in the, uh, in the uh, history of the gay community, but this much it seems that, uh, you know, put them in a place where there are religious people that uh, protest their antics, and they become even more bizarre more weird. I mean, you know, weird. Weird. Crazy. So, uh, the morale says that it's the Jews' fault. It's the Jews' fault. The Jews drove them to the extreme as they went. But the converse is also true, that the Egyptians drove us to our extremes. And the morale says that one of the fringe benefits of our experience in Israel is that we emerged pure in the area of Kedusha, in the area of sexuality, because we were so revolted by Mitzrayim, there was a polarization. So therefore there was something that was achieved specifically by our being enslaved in Mitzrayim that would not have happened had we been somewhere else. Fantastic thing. Not all of us. Not all of us. Pardon? Not only is it, was most of them got killed. You know, this this medrash, um, you know, needs so much explanation. But I don't know if we should uh, invoke it to to minimize the. Uh, we don't know what it means. That medrash. Who's in Ralph says? Who's that what? Thing is, if you look at Kisisa, what happens was when the Yidin were on their own, and they didn't have that oppression, this polar opposite, with the Cheda and Ego, they were involved with the party and they were writing and all the stuff that went on the next morning, and there was licentiousness and, you know, apparently yeah, some serious things going on, so it, which they didn't do in Mitzrayim. Yeah, it, it may, it may, maybe we need the, uh, the opposition to keep us honest, I don't know. But in any case, this is what Ralph says. The uh, the uh, Reb Tzadok has a totally different approach, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. How Reb Tzadok understands the the purpose of our being enslaved in Mitzrayim. What does Mitzrayim stand for? And it writes like this: The Mitzrayim hayakayach hayizgabrus neged zulasim. In Mitzrayim, there was the power of asserting one's strength over others. Ulishtabed and to enslave, Vulavada Vaidas Perach, and to make people work back breaking labor. Loyokalosum Ebid Lotseis. And no slave could leave. This is a Rashi in Pasha Sisra. Vad Sha'amar to the extent that Pyra himself said, Mia Shema Sir Esma Bakolo, who is God? So I should listen to his voice. Mahotzi is Bnei Yisrael to take out the Jews. Shechas of Atzmo Power considered himself Gibor Umenatzeach. He was mighty and a victor. Neged Akol to everybody. Shein Shum Kayach. Shem Mitzias Shum Kayach. There isn't any strength at all. Shuyuchal his Gaber Negdo Lenafchal that could overpower him and conquer him. In other words. There are nations that are peace-loving nations. Live and let live. This is our place. That's your place. As your existence, your independent existence, doesn't disturb me, doesn't bother me. 
was Mitzrayim was a society that it could not tolerate the existence of something else. It felt the compulsion to overpower, to conquer, to control, to enslave, to be the masters of all things. This was the nature. And that there should be a power that was superior to them was so abhorrent it, 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 it couldn't be tolerated to the extent that even when Moshe Rabbeinu came and he said, I am representing the God who is the creator of all things, the power couldn't be civil. He couldn't tolerate that. He said, who is this God? I should listen to him. I'm not going to listen to him. That I am the mightiest. I am the strongest. There is no force in the world that can overpower me. To the contrary, I overpower all things. It's the will to, to conquer and control. That is the essence of Mitzrayim. And their king was considered a god. This is a Pasuk in Nechezko, which in which Paro says, the river is mine and I made myself. Now what this means, I mean, there are various Pshatim. The Malcolm understands that the, the mythology of Mitzrayim was this, that the, uh, the river, the Nile, was filled with all sorts of serpents. But there was one chief serpent, which was the master of the Nile, and that serpent made itself and made the river. Now, you can't ask questions of mythology. You know, I don't know what, what that means to make yourself. I mean, did you exist before you existed? You know, how, how do you make yourself? I don't know the answer to that question. But this is what they believed. They believed that there was this serpent that made itself, and that serpent was the master of the river, the creator and master of the river. And uh, Paro believed that he was the embodiment of that serpent. Whatever that means. So that's what the Malcolm says. And the other before us learn it much more simply, that liya ori means I have my river, not that it's my river, I made the river, but I have my river, and I am a self-made man. The idea of a self-made man doesn't mean that he created himself out of not. It means that whatever power he amassed, whatever wealth he amassed, is thanks to his own effort, because I have the river. Now let me just uh, comment on that. We've talked about this in the past. The um, the Pasuk says in, in Sefer Devar and Parshaykev that uh, Hashem tells us the land that we are coming to, Eretz Yisrael, lo ke Eretz Mitzrayim. It's not like Eretz Mitzrayim. Asher tizra azarocha, in which you plant your seed, v'shkisa v'raglocha, and you irrigate by foot, kigan hayarak, as a vegetable garden. But rather, the land in which you are coming to is Eretz, the harm of the coast, land of the hills and valleys, the Matara Shemaim Tishtamoyim. By the rain of heaven, you'll drink water. So there's a beautiful, beautiful Rajbam. He says like this He says that Eretz is soil, in a way, is the best land, in a way, it's the worst land. In a way that Eretz Mitzrayim is much better, in a way, Eretz Mitzrayim is much worse. Of course, how so? Zeret Mitzrayim is a land which is totally dependent on irrigation. And irrigation is a function of human effort. If you work hard, you'll irrigate the field. If you don't work hard, you won't irrigate the field. So on the one hand, you're not dependent on the rain, which is very good. If you work hard, you'll be successful. There it's so you can't do that. There it's the soil. It's the land of mountains and valleys. You can't slip the water up the mountain, down into the valley. It's not going to work. It's, it's not flat land. It's not easy to irrigate. And therefore, you're totally dependent on rain. So on the one hand, for those people that aren't deserving of the rain, it could be a potential for disaster. <laughs> well, how am I going to get rain? On the other hand, for those people who are deserving of rain, it's the best land. They can sit back and relax. And it rains. And it rains. 
as we pointed out, a very interesting thing, that there was one place in Eretz Yisrael that was like Mitzrayim. It was where stone was. It says, right, that, that Lot saw the land of the Kikar, Kikula Mashka, it was all well watered. Kigam Hashem, Ke'aretz Mitzrayim. It was Avid Mitzrayim. And that one region was like Mitzrayim and that it didn't require rain. And it says in the Pasuk that uh, Lot lived in Arya Kikar and Avram lived in Eretz Canaan. Ramban asks the question that, uh, what do you mean? Stone was also in Eretz Canaan. So I once said shadows like this. This isn't simply Hasidus. What does that give Eretz Canaan? What's the, the name Eretz Canaan? Where does that word come from, Canaan? Kenia means humility. Eretz Canaan is the land of humility. Why? Because you're utterly dependent on the rain, utterly dependent on God. So a person is humble. So it's the one place where uh, they weren't humble was stone. It says in the Pasuk in the Yechezkel that the stone is Ga'in Sivas Lechem. They were proud and haughty because they had ample supply of bread, which they achieved through their own effort of irrigation without being dependent on the rain. So the truth was that, that Avram lived in Eretz Canaan. Avram lived in the mountainous region, as we know in the story of uh, Lot. And uh, Lot didn't want to live in Eretz Canaan. Technically, he was within the borders of Eretz Canaan, but it didn't have the quality of Eretz Canaan. And uh, it's an amazing thing. We, we pointed out once before that, that Avram Avinu, when he had his machlekes with Lot, so he says, uh, pick where you want to go. If you, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And Lot went, where did he go? Well, keep in mind, a very interesting thing, that um, in the Chumash, when it talks about right, it always means south. Whenever it says left, it means north. You know why that is? See, by convention, our maps have north on the top. Why is that? Why is north always on the top? It's after the invention of the compass. Right, because the needle of the compass points, points the magnetic north, so therefore, by convention, north is always on top of the map. But before the compass was invented, right, where did, what was on top of the map? Sun. East. By convention, east was always the top of maps because uh, it, it's the direction of the rising sun. And therefore, right is south, right, and left is north. So Tavrom uh, right, to, to live in the Jordan Valley, which was irrigated, was, was, was beyond imagination. Who would want to live in a place like that? Because you come to Eretz Yisrael because you want to be dependent on God. So therefore you're going to live in the mountainous spine that runs down the center of Eretz Yisrael. So the question is, where are you going to live? Are you going to live in the southern part or the northern part? So don't oh, listen. So we can't live together. So if, if I'll go to the right, you go to the left. <laughs> I'll go south, you go north. Uh, you go uh, north, I'll go south. Right? Well, says, uh, I'll go to the Kikar Yard. <laughs> it, was, it, was just, it made no sense. Who'd want to go to a place like that? Then but that's what it says. Lot, the Vaisa Lot Mikedem. It says, Lot traveled from the east, which means that Lachari he went to the west. west, which is problematic, right? Because really, if anything, he was going from the west to the east, right? So the Chazal are bothered by that. The Chazal say that Mikeda means Shenosa Mikadmono Shaloyla. Kedem also means ancient. Right? He, he departed from the ancient one of the world, meaning he traveled to escape God. Right? So how is going to stone escaping God? Because he didn't want to live in the mountainous region which was dependent on main water. He wanted to live in the area of the Kikar Yardin, which was Kigana Shem Keretz Mitzrayim. It was like Egypt. 